Recently, my flight was on TV because people said, hey, we have a visitor that's joined our water TV cameras go up. <laughs> I'm just telling you that now you're in a situation with UAVs, there are more that are going on. A lot of people can fly. At least they can fly, but you need to know when you're doing this, what are the issues that are important. <laughs> Fine. There's one more thing that I have. You have a crib about what I've just done. I said that I will roll, rotate the lift vector. I will rotate about some point that is there. There is a radius we can do. I mean, I'm not going to do the expression, the turn radius, what would be there, right? And uh, I will yaw so that I am pointed in the direction in which I'm flying. Okay. So far, so good. Any, co any complaints? Mechanics point of view? No, you don't have one. There's a reason why I'm asking. Straight and level flight. See, I sort of cheated. I made this a little greater than W, but actually it's not. I need to do something to make L. If I rotate, if I like this, lift vector and weight vector are the same. If I rotate, the component of the lift vector that is along the way is no less because I flipped over. I also have to pitch up. I also have to do a nose up to get more lift so that one component goes towards the radially inward direction. And I'm still supporting my weight. Otherwise, I start to turn, but I will descend. I start to turn, but I will descend. Am I making sense? So you can do a climb turn, level turn, descending turn. Okay, these are all possibilities, right? So yeah, so it is a it is a it is a what should I say? The the pitch that is climb. Yaw, there is a rudder which is uh, what do you call it? Uh, yaw, and of course the ailerons which are roll. We can use them basically now to get from point A to point B. Okay, that is the key. Let me just say something about parts of an airplane or whatever, so that we again like we know, uh, and maybe we talk about lift and propulsion. That's a little performance. Is that fine? Are there any questions? Questions? Okay, so I already said the forward or nose, tail, wing, things that you know. This is called a rectangular wing. It's part of classification, but I will just tell you the plan form as seen from above. It's called the projected plan form that involves the wing that is in the fuselage. We treat that as the whole wing. What is inside the fuselage? This is the fuselage. What is inside the fuselage may be referred to as a ghost wing or whatever, but it is part of the wing. Okay. The actual element may be some structural elements going on, but we count it as part of the wing. As Professor Murthy said, uh, the fuselage at an angle of attack does generate some lift. Right? So we can't calculate it. This area, this full area, SW. This is the wing area, projected platform area, as seen projected platform area. Okay, projected platform area. There's another area that we use, which is called wetted area. Wetted areas, you can imagine that if I take something that has a funny shape, if you dip it into paint, whatever part that the paint covers, that is the wetted area. Am I making sense? Okay. So that would be the total area. So that we are interested in when we are talking about drag and so on. Okay. But this is a Primary lifting surface. This is the surface that overcomes our weight. Primary lifting surface. And therefore, whatever we do, we will do with respect to this area. So I have to tell you what is it that we are going to do with this area. But anyway, parts. This is the span. Given the symbol B. Where shall I write that? Span. B. Wing area. SW. Cord, you already know. C. You can have a, you can have this can be at a, an angle. Okay. There are stability related benefits that you get from it. So they can be at an ang angle depending on whether it's called a dihedral, so the wing can be pointed upwards, 
Typically, if you notice the sky wing pointed downwards, okay, this is called the dihedral, anhedral. That's just VK. Anything else that we want? Port and starboard, we have already said. You may see high lift devices. You will see in airplanes sometimes near the fuselage. Also, there are control surfaces. They are called flaps. If you deploy the flaps, the lift that you generate when you are taking off larger. Okay. So we will, so it's possible for you to generate more lift when you want more lift. Okay. So let me see, is there anything else that I need to give you? I think this is okay for now. Okay, so we have parts of an airplane. Let me now say something about uh, drag. I think what I do is I will do the, uh, I just say a little hand waving about propulsion. Let's say just do a little hand waving about propulsion and then get into, okay, then get into this. So let me, uh, I'll erase all of this. Yeah, so how do, how do uh, rockets fly? Because I know this is something that you'd have, I'd say I'm trying to make sure that I only deal with material you would have done in school. You understand what I'm saying? I want to pitch this at the level because that is a common factor all of you have. I'm guaranteed about that. Okay, that's the reason why I'm doing this. How do rockets fly? What is the story you heard? Just third law. Action and reaction are equal and opposite. Okay. That is very vague law. If you think about it, what does it mean? Action and reaction are equal and opposite. You know, so to what, where does the reaction come? How does it come? So you sort of make up. It is a, it is more a statement of sort of a uh, equilibrium. If something is, you know, it's either dynamic, static, but what an equilibrium? You just say summation of forces is zero. But the forces are acting on two different things, but action. So when you have it, when you have a, you have a, uh, when you have a jet, when you have a jet of air coming, okay. So I, I, I'm drawing, I'm drawing a rocket in a very ugly fashion. Right, I'm drawing some spherical thing. Like I said, like we have spherical cows, right? We will go with the sphere. I'm drawing in an ugly fashion. So, what is the action? Jet coming out? I don't know. See, I understand this action and reaction equal, equal and opposite. I am applying a force. The desk is just one. Okay. In fact, there is equilibrium, summation of those two forces is zero. Okay, that is fine. Then right? I'm not going to get into a discussion on force and all of that stuff because we can spend a lot of time on that. But okay, so that is that is fine. Action and it. But this is uh, some air going on. So what? So we have to look at what is the how does this work? So normally, what we do. The actual analysis, if you want to do it in a mathematically precise fashion, you have to derive a conservation law. Okay, so this is something that we like. This is this is the scientific game that we play. I change something, what is invariant? I change something, I move this bottle from here to there, the mass of water does not change. Conservation of mass. You understand what I'm saying? So we have come up with, I make changes to the system, what is invariant? I want to know that. If something is invariant, then I can say A plus B must be zero because it's invariant. Now I can say A equals minus B. I can do all my manipulation. I want things to be zero. Things add up to zero, I'm very happy. Am I making sense? So if you have, you can do conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, conservation of energy. So we look at it and say that, oh, there is this coming thing coming out. I'll draw a control volume. I can go through this full derivation. When I do conservation of momentum, and I can basically say that, oh, there is some momentum flux because of this jet out here, 
and tell a story about where the force is. You know that there is a force. But where does the force come from? Look at this. I am applying a force. My hand comes in contact with the table and I push. I understand where the force comes from. Where does the force come from? There is just a jet coming out. Okay. So what you have to do is, let's go back to a simple story. I have like a balloon. Okay. We make this rigid. Okay. So we have this rigid ball. ball. I fill it up with a gas at high pressure. So then now I have a pressure here everywhere in all directions, same value. That is what we have been told about pressure. Pressure is isotropic. It acts the same direction, same in all directions. Okay. So I have this pressure. Will the ball move? It's in equilibrium. You understand what I'm saying? If you take a strip of area here into pressure, I can find an equivalent area here into pressure. Exactly opposite. Okay. Exactly opposite. Now I am going to break that symmetry. I am going to put a hole here. When I put a hole here, this is high pressure, this is low pressure, this air will start coming out. 3 plus half rho v squared equals a constant. I get this flow, therefore the pressure drops. The pressure on the surface, the pressure here drops. The pressure continuously changes. It does, it's not an abrupt. You can't be. How can there be, you know, there is a hole there with zero pressure. Why will this pressure be high? I mean, air will start to go from here also. Am I making sense? It will be flowing internally, it will be flowing from all sides. So now what happens is this is no longer the same everywhere. This is smaller here, slightly getting larger as you go towards this. And you have larger pressure on the inside. At the head of the rocket motor, you have very high pressure. At the tail of the rocket motor, you have lower pressure. The momentum that is going out is related to that pressure. That's why I'm able to use that momentum. Am I making sense? In actuality, it is this pressure distribution inside that is creating. So even if you take a jet engine, there is an air intake, there is a compressor, there is a combustion chamber, burn fuel, turbine, Turbine is running the compressor. Something has run the compressor. Turbine is running the compressor. You get hot gas now. So far, we have what is called a gas generator. Hot gas. Now you decide what you want to do. You can put another turbine and run a propeller, turboprop. Or you can just expand it through a nozzle. You say, oh, you expand it through a nozzle, you get thrust. Nozzle typically looks like that. You have gases coming over. Like I said, I don't want to get too much into deriving equations and all that. Large area, large area, small speed. You reduce the area, speed has to go up. Okay. So this is a nozzle. Nozzle is anything that takes area. The word nozzle is anything where incoming air is made faster. You exchange a nozzle is a device that exchanges pressure and velocity. Okay, changes the pressure and velocity exchange. So this comes out. Pressure here is higher, pressure here is lower. So what is the direction of force that is experienced by the nozzle? Just think about it. No, look at the look at the geometry. Be careful. Because this is counterintuitive. The nozzle does not do what you think it does directly. Pressure force is that way. It has a component in this direction. The airplane is flying in that direction. The nozzle actually contributes drag directly. If I take if I take a hose, I take a tube, right? I am a fireman, I'm fighting water. I mean, I'm fighting a fire with water. So the question that you have to ask is, do I pull the hose back because the hose wants to go forward? Or is the hose coming back and I am pushing it forward? Which one am I doing? Yeah, see, there, there is a confusion. So the problem is, 
So we are thinking there's a jet coming there and therefore this fellow wants to come back. No. If the if the if the pipe is coiled and I turn on the tap, what will happen to the pipe? It'll want to straighten out. It'll want to straighten out. See, the water is going that way, and the water is trying to take the pipe with it. You understand what I'm saying? I have to hold the pipe back. The air is going this way. It wants to take, it doesn't want that nozzle. I have to put bolts here to hold it in. That way, that fellow will fly away. It wants to take it with it. You understand what I'm saying? The force experienced by it is drag. The thrust is coming from all these compressors, compressing. High pressure on the back side. What does a compressor do? It takes low pressure, makes it into high pressure. I have a blade, low pressure on this side, high pressure on that side, thrust. You see where it's coming from? The whole point is you are generating somewhere a pressure distribution that is doing this thrust. Okay. That's the story that I want you to remember. Analysis point, whatever is there, but remember, finally, the force comes through the surface. You understand what I'm saying? Somewhere, some surface has to be experiencing that force. Otherwise, it cannot be communicating to your material. Is that okay? You have to bear this in mind because uh, people will do momentum analysis, all of the stuff, say, oh, we're getting the thrust. You may end up putting your sensor, actuator, whatever in the wrong spot. You have to know what is the actual force distribution. Right? Don't just take one gross number that they give you. Am I making sense? Okay. You have to be a bit careful with this game. Right? Okay. So this is the story as far as this is the story as far as thrust generation goes. Now we know how to generate thrust. You can put a propeller, right? Low pressure before the propeller, high pressure behind the propeller, no spot. Okay, we, we understand where this comes from. Let's look at that equation. Okay. No, I want to switch back. I want to switch back to my drift story. Done. I'm not a propulsion fellow. I'm done with propulsion. Okay. Right. Let's switch back to, you know, equations, right? They have, there are many things that they have to satisfy. Homogeneity of physical units is one of them. All the units of all the terms have to be the same, which means that if this is pressure, that is also pressure. We don't like, and uh, off the top of my mind, for some reason, Mechanical engineering, I'm only getting examples from kinematics. But I know uh, electrical engineers, for instance, do a lot of uh, design where if you design it using ratios of resistors, ratios of properties, then when you fabricate any change, any, any uncertainties in process don't get you into trouble. Am I making sense? Because the whole die has been, the whole die, so if, you're, if it's based on ratios, it's based on non-dimensional numbers. Am I making sense? Then you are you are you are protected. You are you protected your design. The behavior doesn't change, right? That is the key. So in a similar fashion, we tend to go to a large extent with non-dimensional numbers. We are just just love non-dimensional. We use they allow us to do all sorts of things. So here, what I can do is I have told you one quantity that I have which I put an arrow that is far away, which is V infinity. So this, incidentally, are there any questions on propulsion? I just quietly went away without asking you. Okay, okay. This is P infinity plus one half rho V infinity. We are assuming that the density doesn't change right now. Okay, incompressible. Equals, remember what I told you, low pass cylinder, I have the stagnation point. So you're starting at P infinity, V infinity here. When you come here, V infinity is not V infinity, V is zero. That's the stagnation point. So this pressure, which is called the static pressure, becomes what is called the total pressure or the stagnation <laughs> Okay. You look at it as, uh, what do you call it? 
to the computer science students, I'm sorry, I can't give you these kinds of examples. No, all, all this time I'm giving either mechanical engineering or electrical engineering, I apologize, okay. But if you take a battery, you know, battery has internal resistance. So you have the open circuit voltage of the battery, P0. You start drawing current, the voltage drops. There is no ideal power source, right? You may talk about ideal power source, you may talk about an ideal voltage, right? But it's not there. The ideal battery is not there. There is an internal resistance. So you will get the, the voltage drop. So I would, if you draw more current, voltage drops more. You understand? So that is the key. So this is, this at one level, think about it that way, right? So not quite, but think about it that way. So you have, you have the P naught, which is there, but you will use that P naught to, to drive the flow. And if you drive the flow, which is what we are doing here, when it is sealed, you have a P naught inside, V is zero, no movement. Then when you make this cut, it starts to move. You start getting the equivalent of a current, and basically the pressure drops. Am I making sense? That's essentially what's happening. So, this stagnation pressure, all of these, I look at this and say, yeah, I like this. This is something that, so if I look at P, these quantities, I can say something with reference, reference to P infinity, or I can say something with respect to, these are reference quantities, these are far away. This is like atmospheric pressure far away, you know, not disturbed by the AFP. This is like the speed with reference to which I'm flying. So I can use these reference quantities. So I say, oh, you have a pressure. How does it differ from, how does it differ from my reference pressure? And divide it by a, by one half rho infinity. They have the same units. This is called static. This is called dynamic pressure. Yeah, it's called dynamic pressure. This gives me a non-dimensional quantity. You understand what I'm saying? This gives me a non-dimensional quantity called CP, pressure coefficient. It's a very simple quantity. So when P is P infinity, zero. P is P infinity, it is zero. CP is zero means you are at P infinity. If P is P naught, so the question is how large can it become? You understand what I'm saying? What is the what is the what is the range, range of diameter? So that I will leave. I will leave to you, right? To think about. So this is this is the pressure coefficient. So we do this, right? We we start, we this, I, I wanted the Bernoulli equation there because I wanted to tell you this is what we do. No, without equations, I'm just going to start non-dimensionalizing things. So what I have is, we will do one first that we know. So you have lift, which is a force. Okay, we have lift, which is a force. Incidentally, because I've talked about units, I want you to check the units of rho, v, infinity, gamma, something, right? You don't have to do it now. You should get force per unit length. Just check to see because remember we did it for an airfoil. We did it for a two-dimensional object, not for a 3D object. So you should get force per unit area. So lift, lift is force. Pressure is units, newtons per meter square. I need an area, then I can get a force. What area shall I use? I've given you only one area so far. So, wing area, wing area, primary lifting surface, SW, one half rho v squared, rho v infinity squared, v squared, SW. And there will be a lift coefficient CL. So, CL is divided by one half. Rho V infinity squared is good. Okay. Just for just for completion of notation, I know it's slight overload. We use C small L for airfoil sections and C capital L for the full wing. 
Okay. One is the section lift, the other is the wing lift. Please. So this allows me, this allows me to basically ask the question if I am flying at a certain speed and I have a certain angle, what is the CL that I get? Am I, am I making sense? What is the lift coefficient that I have? I have not, not told you about the size of the airplane. They have not been saying anything about it, but now I don't care. I just want to know what is the CL? This wing, what is the maximum CL? That, is there a maximum CL that can be reached? You now we have these questions. Is there a CL max? Am I making sense? Is there a CL max? So what is this? What is this? What does this do? Okay. So this is non-dimensionalization. We will come back to other terms because we have drag. I want to talk about drag. Okay. Let us. So we have many, many, many non-dimensional parameters we look at. What I want to do is I want to uh, get back into our uh, viscous effects, which we have been ignoring so far. So we know we get dragged because of viscous effects are uh, viscosity is the fluid equivalent of friction, one level. So uh, fluids, you know, there is this, there is this, there are two, two phenomena that you have, physical phenomena that you have. One is addition, something sticks to something else. The other is cohesion, things stick to each other. Okay, cohesive forces that are like molecules attract each other. Adhesive forces, unlike molecules, right? Whether they attract water, what is that relation? That is it. So, viscosity comes from these cohesive forces. So, you have, you have an attempt, right, for fluid to flow, for different fluid elements to flow at different speeds possibly. And there is a resistance because of cohesion. Okay, that's where viscosity comes. I will do the usual game that they do. They look at flow over a flat surface. That is the usual thing they do. So, in an ideal flow, which I was talking about earlier, in an ideal situation, uh, you have no viscosity. So, if I have, if I set up a V infinity, which is uniform, this is the spatial variation of the velocity. Okay. If it's a, so if there is no viscosity, this plate, now we can see, once we are doing it in our mind, we can do whatever we want. This plate has zero thickness. For all practical purposes, the flow won't be disturbed. The plate is aligned to the oncoming flow, the flow will flow. Nothing, the plate has zero thickness. It's not even disturbing the flow in the other direction. No disturbance, nothing. The flow will go. But if you have adhesive forces, right, and cohesive forces, this fluid, when it hits this wall, sticks to the wall. It can't flow. Right? So now, up here I have this flow. Here, it can't flow. It's zero. And in between the fluid particles, right, each one is resisting the other flow of flowing, but they can't resist because it's a fluid. You understand? A fluid, so far, say I have not gone to fluid mechanics. Like I said, what is flight? In fluid mechanics, I would start with the question, what is a fluid? And the fluid is something that can't resist that sharing action. If you put it in a, if you put it in a, uh, a container and you squeeze, maybe it can resist water for the forces that we apply to resist. But you take the same water in a plastic bag or you take that milk packet and you start doing it, it can't resist. That milk packet will go back and forth. Am I making sense? Can't resist. Can't resist shear. That is the fundamental thing about a fluid. So it can't resist this shearing action. Can't stop the shearing action. It will try to resist. Okay, I will be careful with my words because it's actually trying to resist. So as a consequence, what happens is this sticks. The one above slightly escapes. One above slightly escapes more, slightly escapes more, and then you get this. So you get a region close to this wall on the boundary layer. The fluid is slowing down. Why did it slow down? Because the plate is adhering to it. The fluid is slowing down. Why does it slow down? 
because the plate is resisting this motion. The plate is applying a force on the fluid. The fluid is applying a force equal and opposite reaction, unfortunately, on the plate. They have no choice. I want to move in air. By the fact that I want to move in air, there is going to be relative motion with respect to me and the fluid. I will be applying a tangential force on the fluid. The fluid will be applying a tangential force on me. So this fluid is trying to carry the plate along with it and is applying a force in that direction. It's trying to carry the plate along. Right? Plate is being hit. I have to apply a force to hold the plate. That force, that's the equilibrium. That force that I'm applying is going through to the fluid and slowing the fluid. Is that okay? And it turns out, if I actually look at the plate, so now what I do is, see, this is one vague thing, right? It just goes gradually. And if you think about it mathematically, at infinity, it will become whatever it is, right? That effect will go all the way. Don't like it. So I will pick a value when it becomes, say, 99% of whatever that V infinity is. That is the edge, this boundary layer edge. So now I'm plotting the boundary layer edge. Boundary layer edge will be something like this. Boundary layer actually grows. So I will do better than the physicist. Instead of spherical cows, I'll go with point cows. I will idealize further. So I have cows. For my mathematical purposes, they are all points. The advantage with point cows is I can put an impulse of cows. I can put all my cows in one spot. Actual cows, that's a problem. But for the sake of this discussion, I can put all my cows because they are point cows in one spot. Okay. So I have grass. The cows have a certain appetite. All of them are the same, right? Because this is the way they thought expect. So they eat grass. So if in this plane, in this plane, I have point cows, I have cows at a point, they start eating grass. As time evolves, what do you expect to happen? I'm sort of showing you the, <laughs> but the grass will get eaten. And you would think, right, as a first order, whatever, that there will be a circular patch of ground that is exposed and the grass is disappeared. We make them efficient, right? They eat all the grass before they grow. They grow in time. And for a given set of cows, as they grow more and more, the rate at which it grows will also de decrease. So the periphery is increasing. More grass. You understand what I'm saying? Everybody is okay with that example? Okay. Now, I have a certain amount of grass per unit area, density of grass. Same cows, high density of grass, the circle will grow slowly. Low density of grass, circle grow very fast. Very clear. Okay. For a given density of grass, very hungry cows, circle will grow fast. Cows that are, okay, Brazilian grass, not good. Whatever. You understand what I'm saying? Circle will grow slowly. Am I making sense? Is that okay? So now there are two parameters that I have. Grass per unit time that cows are eating, grass per unit area that they can, and then there's a, you can tie, you have to tie it up with because there's a time factor and how, how it is growing because we are talking at the rate at which that circle is growing. Okay. So I can get a non dimensional number. Similar fashion, my plate is like those cows. My plate is eating momentum from the fluid, it's applying a force. Everywhere on the fluid, my plate is consuming momentum from the fluid. It's just extracting. So it starts off here. As soon as it comes, it extracts, but it can only get the immediate fluid. You go further down, immediate fluid stop. Then the next one also goes. And this goes, grows slowly. It doesn't grow in a linear fashion or whatever. It sort of grows in a quadratic fashion. In Fluid mechanics and boundary layer theory, we call this a timeline coordinate. It is like time. It behaves. The differential equations that you generate, it looks like a timeline coordinate. It actually comes out mathematically. Timeline coordinate. It behaves like time. This direction of the plane behaves like time and it extracts out momentum. If the outside fluid 
very, very high speed, very dense grass, then this plane can only do so much. That thing will be very thin. That will be a region, boundary layer thickness will be very thin. Am I making sense? If the outside momentum is not that much, then this will extract and you will get a boundary layer that grows much faster. Am I making sense? Is that okay? So we have to have so outside outside momentum and the rate at which this fellow is extracting out, right? Viscosity. Viscosity is uh, characterized by a parameter mu, which is a viscosity coefficient. Okay. So the force per unit area, the tangential force, stress per unit area. I'll just write this out. Don't don't get you know don't get bothered with the force tangential force per unit area is no I called it B no I'm not called it in. Okay. So this I will call U as a function of y. This is my y coordinate direction. U is along the x coordinate direction. U as a function of y. No so you go y. Proportional to it's proportional to the sharing rate. See we we we, we, we let us be very clear. Uh, we don't like nonlinear things. So every model that we create is linear. V equals I R. At, you understand what I'm saying? This is exactly like that. So you just basically say linear. Elasticity, linear elasticity. Hook here and so on. You understand what I'm saying? Young's modulus is there. Sigma is that epsilon, whatever it is into. We, we linearize. Linear. Everything is linear. Okay. So only if you are forced. Somebody pains us, we say, okay, okay, I will do nothing. Otherwise, we will only want to do linear. And even then, we quietly locally linearize. Right? You take, uh, start telling somebody the uh, yesterday that you go, you, you, you go to a bias point or you go to an operating point and you do small signal analysis. That's effectively what you do. Right? We cheat. We always try to, as far as possible, if we can get away with linear, we'll get away with linear. Okay. So, this is your, so I say, okay. That my the forces that I am applying are looking like this is the fellow that's that is force per unit area. Okay, that's what that is what is that's the force that I'm applying, right? Because I want to look at force per unit area because I'm saying I have one meter clear, I'm holding it, I'm applying a force S, right? But what is that what is happening here? So I do force per unit area. Okay. So force per unit area. That's just, that is like mu. Okay, that is fine. And I need something to catch the momentum. Momentum is like rho u, momentum per rate, unit volume, whatever. Okay, momentum is like rho u. So, momentum flux, momentum flux is actually p plus one half rho v squared, or v squared, right? So, I actually need a v squared. But uh, what I will do is to, so, The, the, see, I can multiply and divide this by a u. So if I look at u by l, u by l, mu, this looks like that. Don't look at it very straight. I mean, don't look at it in a, you have to sort of look at it slightly like that and say, yeah, they look the same. Am I making sense? Don't look at it very seriously, say, show me mathematics. Right? Just, just look at it like that. Say, yeah, that looks like u by l is a derivative u, u by l. Okay, that's fine. Okay, l is some length. I will take the length. I should use, I will be very honest. I should use delta. I will use it. I will use the length of it. Okay, mu, u by l. So, okay, I will use some characteristic length, some length. mu, u by l. One u cancels. And you get rho u l by mu. This is called Reynolds number. This is also non dimensional. Because they are, they, are, they, are, they are half rho u squared, newtons per meter squared. So, you do, you do, away, newtons per meter squared. All non dimension. Then, on its number. Okay, non dimensional. Okay. So, this Reynolds number basically is telling me something about viscous effects with respect to oncoming air. Okay. And what it is basically saying this boundary layer, it grows, it depends on the Reynolds number, it grows. 
depends on the square root of Raynaud symbol. Okay. That is because there's a length involved, the square root of Raynaud. So this boundary layer, how it grows, and why does that, why do I experience drag? Where does this force come from? Because now we do our that momentum theorem that I was talking about. A, the incoming momentum and the outgoing momentum are not the same. Therefore, there must have been a force. That is the force on the plane. That is the force on my airplane. That is the drag that I'm experiencing. Okay. Everything on the airplane, I'm trying to go forward. And on the wing, the air is flowing. And the air is trying to take the top surface of the wing with it. I am stopping it. I have a force. That is drag. Okay. That is drag that it experiences. That is it. Okay, that is what we call parasite drag. It's not doing anything else. It's just drag. It is there even if I don't, even if I'm not lifting nothing, it is there. That's a drag. Okay. This, okay, are there any questions? Okay, so you say flat plate and all that is very nice. What happens in real life? Airfoil and my friend, the circle. Okay, start with the circle. So I have a stagnation point here. I've already told you the in the, in the ideal situation, the flow speeds up to twice the to infinity. I mean twice the speed, right? But actually it's not speeding up because it's sticking. There's no speeding up. You can't, there's addition. So actually there's a boundary layer that's building up here. There's a boundary layer that's building up. So as the fluid goes, now something strange is happening. So in the ideal situation that I imagined yesterday, P plus half rho V squared V is zero, speeds up, pressure drops, then it exchanges pressure and the speed momentum back and comes back to stagnation. Comes back. Now, as I go up, momentum is being taken out. I have a half rho v squared, but that half rho v squared, I am in debt. You understand what I'm saying? There is an interest payment that is going to the surface of the body. I am not getting back the amount of, I don't have, by the time I come to the top, I don't have that half rho v squared that I want. Now I need to go back to that plot, that spot. I can't do it. You understand what I'm saying? So effectively what happens is, this air, uh, sort of just leaves directly. You can't negotiate that term. You can't go around it. And here, okay, nature will not leave this void. You know what I'm saying? Here, something funny will start happening. You will start getting a flow field, right? You will get these vortices, you will get this flow, and the more realistic flow than what I drew yesterday happens. Then you get a wake. Behind the bus, there will be a big wake. You understand? Enormous amount of time, right? Can't avoid it. The shape. This is streamlined, not that bad. So it speeds up, it doesn't speed up that much, and not, not that bad. But still, the boundary layer is growing, and there is a point at which it can separate. You understand what I'm saying? There's a point at which it can separate. Okay. So what I will do, I'm going to draw CL versus the angle of attack. So if I change the angle, this starts looking more like that. You understand what I'm saying? The top surface starts looking more like Change the angle, right? If I change the angle to that, if you look at the flow field, the stagnation point will be there. This is starting, if you look at it, it looks, it's starting to look more like that. That's not nice. So here, what happens is the boundary layer manages to go around this and it may leave there. It may separate earlier. The separation point, the point at which separation occurs, may move forward. It was here, it was now in the airfoil moved up. Top surface is my low pressure surface. I am losing region there where this high speed air is going. You understand what I'm saying? My lift will drop. So the CL versus alpha curve for an airfoil, right? Symmetric airfoil. Symmetric so at alpha equals zero, it will go through the origin. For small signals, it's basically linear. 
okay small signals 2d airfoil in fact that slope aerodynamic ideally will be 2 pi you understand so but reality it will be something else and then at some point the separation starts and it will start leveling off and then you hit a cl max am i making sense so there is a maximum cl that you can see. this is my cl versus alpha if i camber it same family typically what will happen is at zero i am generating lift but the slope doesn't change so i am going to get something that looks like this hey now how it happens depends on what family whether it goes to a higher value or levels of whatever it depends on the particular family of curves but it gets offset which means that at angle zero itself i am generating lift am i making sense that's the only difference so the camber that's really what it's going to do so primarily this angle of attack change is what are what we are what is the major game that we major games that we play is that okay so one of the things that i wanted to tell you was because of viscosity which i casually ignored yesterday i get the drag component i also get the maximum cl that i can get i can't just be changing obviously if i do this i won't get alpha 90 degrees i'll get no lift we know that so somewhere at some point there must be a maximum value unfortunately it's not 420 okay unfortunately it's not 420 degrees it may be 15 degrees 17 degrees you have to do it depends on what what is the what is the nature of the what is the nature of the airfoil section and how it is is that okay there is a maximum cl that you can get it's very important so you are going to look at airfoil characteristics and say that oh you have chosen this airfoil this is what you can you know so there is a that is the thing if you are interested in it that Abbott and Van Dyneoff, that the book that I suggested, will have great right? or you can look online and they will tell you what is the CL max that you'll get for that airfoil section, section, two dimensions. Now we'll go to 3D. Are there any questions? Yeah, today it's been it's more not as much engaging as opposed to as opposed to there are certain things that I want. So I want you to do more. Okay. There are certain things that I want to tell you, so it, because it's important. Uh, as you already said, when the fighter plane is going in the air show, yeah. they will turn 360 degrees. Yeah. Then how it is possible when there is no lift after 60 degrees? No, 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 this, this angle, this angle is just the airfoil section. This is the section. So the angle is with respect to the pitching. Nose up, nose down. That's the angle I'm talking. So if he, if he is going nose up, nose down, right? And the other thing, okay, just to be clear, uh, if I understand your question right, you are saying that this is the top, and I can see it, you can't see it. I am talking about this position. Yeah, yeah, and I got it. That's the top, I hope you can see that. That's the top, this is the bottom. So you are talking about the airplane doing this. Oh, you're talking about the airplane doing this. Yes. No, so the airplane doing this, when the pilot is in this mode, then uh, the pilot has to have a negative angle of attack. The pilot has to have a negative angle of attack in the airframe coordinates. You understand what I'm saying? The pilot, pilot is this way. Which way do you want the lift? You want the lift towards your floor. You are sitting in the chair. You want the lift to be going down because you are flying upside down. Am I making sense? Right? So the, the airplane will be, so it will be, it will be, it will be at an angle of attack with respect to the oncoming air. The pilot is flying upside down. Oncoming air upside down like this and they generate lift. Symmetric, this continues. I should, I should have, I should have indicated, this continues. Negative alpha also is generated. It generated downward force. Okay. It's complicated. These days you have, see, I tell you, there are technologies that aerospace engineers invented because they had no choice. I don't know if you're familiar. Any guys may have studied carburetors. Have you guys heard of a carburetor? Carburetor is one strange device, okay, for the electrical engineering and computer science students that don't know, maybe. Carburetor is a strange device. 
it ha it allows so fuel to flow and it will allow the air and fuel to mix so that combustion can take place okay that is the, that's the idea so how do you regulate the fuel fuel flow so they have a local tank the equivalent of a local capacitor and they have a little float as the capacitor fills that is the uh, the the local tank fills up, the float rises and it plugs the hole that is feeding the fuel. You understand what I am saying? That's the way it works. Float. Float meaning gravity downwards, floating. You understand what I am saying? You are using buoyancy force. Now you imagine I take the same bottle or glass and I turn it upside down. Uh, not that easy. Okay, we have actually designed, there are carburetors that will work with the float upside down. Am I making sense? People have done it. But then you say, no. Fuel injection. Inject the fuel directly. I don't care. You understand what I'm saying? You come up with the technology so that you eliminate that, you eliminate all that nonsense of headache flight. Regular transport aircraft, you're not worried. But you can still do maneuvers, no? Where the G, the forces that are experienced, you know, that are, you know, you go in this amusement ride, all of this stuff. Go up, come down, then so you feel those forces. You are you are you are making assumptions about the gravity which may not be there when you are flying in three dimensions. So you have to be very, very, very careful. Okay. You have to be really careful. So the one of the things why flying upside down pilots have to be careful is there's a reversal of the controls that take place. What is up is down, you know, orientation. That's one of the uh, one of the big advantages that you have flying from the ground. When it is flying there, especially if you can see it, that you don't lose orientation. Fly by instruments, whatever, everything you're doing by instruments, it's fine. If you're sitting in the airplane and you're actually flying, you are sometimes you can lose. If you're in clouds, you can forget what is up, what is down. Very, very, very one of the one of the accidents that occurs very often is what is we 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 use the soft term, controlled flight into the ground. That is basically, you, you don't realize that you fly, you fly basically into the ground. You understand what I'm saying? Because you don't have a sense of orientation. Okay. So anyway, so coming back, uh, this, angle of, this angle of attack is only with respect to the pitching. Okay. And this, you will, you can generate by going the other way around. You can generate, of course, if it's cambered, it is offset again. So there is a point at which you go to a, there is a zero left hand. There is an alpha naught at which the lift is zero. And then you have to go beyond that to generate right? lift in the other direction. Okay, so this is as far as, so let us now go to, are there any other questions? I want to go to what we call a finite thing. Because airfoil section, section 2D, for all practical purposes, it's as though it's infinite. The third dimension, what is the third dimension? We do everything per unit area. So I erase the rho v infinity gamma, will come per unit length. Per unit length, it's in fine in the other direction. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I want to deal with what is called a finite wing. You should tell me if you guys want a break, you should tell me. If you don't, should I just go on or you want to take a break? What do you want? Take a break? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Break and immediately after that, we'll have a group Thank you, sir. Yes. Maybe, maybe finally, because I didn't realize it was going to be echoed on a few stories, which I think maybe should not have put <laughs> So, after this question, we'll see if we can this answer. Okay. I just want to tell, give me just a minute. I just want to tell you one thing. Just tell them one thing. I want to. Just one thing that I need to do. Sure. Just give me five minutes. I draw the wing along. Projected platform. Top surface is low pressure. Bottom surface is high pressure. 
This is the end view of the wing. Top surface is low pressure. I indicate a minus. Bottom surface is high pressure. Okay. So what about at the end? End. That's like a short circuit. How can I have a high pressure here and the low pressure immediately above? There's a path. You understand what I'm saying? So the air here has a tendency to go outward. And the air here has a tendency to go inward. Okay, but let us not forget that we are flying and there is a flow of this. Way. You understand what I'm saying? So if I draw the streamlines on the top surface, the air tends to go towards the middle. Okay. On the bottom surface, the air tends to go, the air coming from the other side tends to go towards the outside. Am I making sense? Because the pressure is high, it's pushing it outward on the bottom. On the top, because the pressure is low, it's pushing it inward. But while it's happening, this one was flying. It's like throwing a stone. Stone is falling, but it's also going forward. Okay, so outward flow, right, on the bottom, inward flow on the outside. So what are you seeing here? Here you are seeing flow this way. And the flow that way. This is basically like a just circular motion. It's called what is okay. Now what that does. So I am going to do a very quick. Okay. So remember, I told you gamma is tied to a current, right? Analogy was a current. So I will shrink that whole current, I, instead of current density, I'll make it into a current, I shrink it down, right, to what is called a vortex. So I get this gamma here, and it basically, like current, it can't, you can't, you, you can't, you can't just stop, you can't have current going and then stopping. You understand what I'm saying, KCL, you can't, how does it work? It can't just stop, let's go somewhere. So this flows out. Now, Ideal, this is an idealization. I have this vortex team. It generates a field around it. You understand? That's what you're seeing. That is this thing that you're seeing. That's that field. That it's generating a field or a velocity field around it. This way. This way. What is the field that's generating here? On the wing itself, it's there. On the wing itself, it's generating a downward velocity. You understand what I'm saying? Look at it. This is the wing. I like this. You understand? On the wing, it's generating. Say, so say, wait a minute. Previously, 2D, I only had the infinity. Now, because of this finite wing, I'm having the Z component, W. That W will generate a force. That force is unfortunately in this direction. More lift, more drag. You don't get something for nothing. Does not happen. That's why I wanted to tell you this. So, V is one half rho V infinity squared S W into C D, a drag coefficient. That C D drag coefficient is C D naught. C D naught, the drag that you experience when you have zero lift. It is a parasitic. I'm deliberately using that word because I know you guys are familiar with it. CD naught. I am doing nothing useful and it is there. Plus, some constant times the square of the lift that you are generating. I am not going to derive this. You can, you can figure it out. There is a velocity which is proportional to the lift and the amount of lift will determine the. You understand? So, the combination will basically give you. Okay. The gamma itself depends on the lift. Rho V infinity gamma. The W, the velocity being generated depends on the lift and the gamma is also connected, basically related to the lift. So the CL squared, that's how it comes. Am I making sense? This is called a drag polar. Okay. So I think we leave it at that. Uh, like I said, if we have time, I was going to do performance, but I think performance is not something that, uh, right? Maybe I'll talk to Professor Deva and he can spend five, 10 minutes talking about performance. Sunday. Okay, Monday. Okay, that's fine. I'll talk to Sudeva and basically maybe he can do five, ten minutes of four. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. After this lecture, when you see that helicopter out there, the Lord clearly see it as a helicopter. 
when you look to the blades and all, you will have a very different uh, thought process in mind how that mechanical body is designed. So, thank you, sir, for thank a very much interesting <laughs> lecture. And we take over for a small break and then a photograph and then we come back. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. मेरे पर भी बस यहाँ तो मुझे 